Hello and welcome to another episode of Messages of Necessity. My name is Kyle Davis and I'm the Director of Public Affairs at the Empire Center and I'm sitting down with Ken Girardin, the Director of Research at the Empire Center, to discuss his recent report called Green Guardrails, where he really dives into all the intricacies of the CLCPA. How are you doing today, Ken? Uh, better now that the report is done. Good. That That's good to hear. So, Ken, I'm curious, um, what what motivated you to want to do this report or um, to dig into the, uh, the CLCPA? The Climate Act that the legislature adopted and the governor signed, Governor Cuomo signed in 2019, is probably the furthest reaching piece of legislation to be passed by New York state government in in several generations it authorizes the executive branch to essentially reshape the entire economy in pursuit of lower emissions there are there's a very tiny there there are, uh, there's a very tiny list of places where the climate act won't have jurisdiction one of them is aviation fuel oddly but every other part of the economy comes under state regulation in this law and the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Public Service Commission, and other agencies together have the authority to restructure not just the way we use energy, but also the way we, we generate energy. So it's the, the Climate Act is amazing in terms of the, the scope. It's also, some people would call this ambitious, I would, I would call this um, a little bit foolish, it's an attempt to simultaneously change the, to electrify the economy and to radically change the way electricity is generated in New York at the same time. They are trying to essentially swap out the wings on the plane in flight, if you wanted to use an analogy. And in other places that are moving towards uh, you know, decarbonization like Quebec, they already get, they're already happy with their grid more or less. They already get almost all their electricity from uh, from, from emission-free sources, primarily hydroelectric and a little bit of nuclear power. So for New York to simultaneously be saying, we're going to change the way uh, something uh, like 65% of our energy is generated, that's uh, that's a ballpark the amount that's coming from, uh, no, sorry, it's a little less than that. Um, but more than half of the energy in the course of a year is coming from fossil fuels in New York. We're going to simultaneously change that and, at least in wintertime, double the extent to which we're relying on the electric grid. That's a pretty bold, that's a, that's a very bold move. So, Ken, the Climate Act was passed in 2019, and we now have five years under our belt of seeing how this thing plays out. One of the pieces in your report is kind of a history lesson, and it talks about the legislature's lost decade. Uh, tell us why understanding the history of this bill is important and, and how it impacts the current conversation. The remarkable thing, more than anything else about the Climate Act, is the extent to which the legislature is trying to surrender its taxing powers and its policymaking powers over to the executive branch. And in almost any other state capital, if you saw state lawmakers agreeing to let a state agency levy a tax and agreeing to, to make policy decisions, you'd say that's that's bonkers. Looking at New York, uh, it makes a little more sense because you saw the legislature, while Andrew Cuomo was governor, just routinely roll over and stop doing oversight, stop engaging in the sort of healthy adversarial relationship between the state's board of directors, basically, and its CEO. Uh, people might remember uh, the uh, the legislature gave Governor Cuomo a pay raise in violation of the state constitution back in 2021. Uh, there was another episode where they agreed to name a bridge after the governor's father. Um, that's kind of a that's kind of a comical one off. But over the if you go back 20 years ago. And look at how the legislature was exercising its oversight functions um, when George Pataki was governor. It's a completely different dynamic from what we saw under Cuomo. So it's important for people to realize that the legislature basically reached a low point in passing the Climate Act. 
in saying, we're not going to set tax levels, the executive branch is going to. We're not going to decide the policies to reach a goal the, the governor is going to. And, and what the Climate Act does is set goals. So it says, we want emissions in 2030 to be 40% lower than they were in 1990. We want 70% of electricity to come from renewables by 2030. Those are goals. Those aren't policies. The policies are, we're going to prohibit people from replacing their, their gas and oil furnaces. Those are, the, those are the policies that are going to be coming out of state agencies as the Climate Act is is implemented but it's important to know the history that it wasn't always like this in new york it isn't like this in most other state capitals and it shouldn't be like that because these are powers that are that that belong to the legislature and they they should not give them away and looking at the state constitution they cannot give them away so i'm always amazed uh when i when i talk to people on the street about kind of the general unawareness of what the climate act is and you've already touched on some of the the key provisions but what are some of those top top line things that folks should know about when it comes to the Climate Act? The Climate Act empowers the state to regulate essentially every portion of the economy. And that's going to mean limiting uh, or prohibiting activities over the next several years. It's going to mean uh, significantly increasing electricity bills as the grid gets reshaped. And the at least the proponents hope it's going to involve uh, shutting down a good chunk um, and eventually all of the oil and gas power plants that are, are right now keeping the lights on. So in your report, Ken, uh, the word trillion comes up and and that should give us pause, right? Uh, that's that's a that's a big number. I don't think any of us can really wrap our minds around that too well. Um, but why don't you talk a little bit about what some of these numbers mean in your report and uh, what 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 everyday New Yorkers can expect from that. When the legislature adopted the Climate Act in 2019, they they did so with the expectation that they'd get to see cost estimates for specific parts of the law that were going to be implemented. So for instance, changing everyone over to electric heat, changing over local government vehicles to electric vehicles, stuff like that was supposed to be costed out. It never happened. At the end of 2022, we saw a, a, a few uh, you know, round numbers coming out um, in the range of 260, 270, 280, 290 billion dollars in terms of costs for the program. And I looked at those numbers and I, I, I wanted to know where they came from because these were, for one thing, net present values. And net present value is a way to talk about um, a long-term liability. So if I, you know, Kyle, if I tell you, you owe me $20,000 a year for the next 40 years, you can say, well, we can discount the stuff way, you know, way, way out in, you know, 20, 30 years from now, and just pretend that we put that money in the bank or put it in treasury bills. And then you develop a net present value to figure out how much money you need to put in the bank now. But in terms of what it's going to cost people, nobody is going to put away money today in 2024 to pay for the electric heat pump that they need to buy in 2032. So we need to talk about it in terms of, of real dollars. And to get to that number, you have to see what is the, what does the Climate Act call for people to spend? And ultimately, it calls for spending about $4.9 trillion over a 30-year period. And that number is offset by $4.3 trillion in avoided spending. So what does that look like? Well, you buy a heat pump, heat pump might be in the neighborhood of $10,000. That's a way to, to, to install electric heat in your house. And that's in the $4.9 trillion column. And then the $5,000 you might've spent replacing that oil or gas furnace, that goes in the $4.3 trillion column. So they're talking about, you know, in giving that $4.3 trillion figure, they're talking about, they're kind of giving us the, uh, the range of the economy that they're looking to restructure and make substitutions in. The problem is, you know, first off, that's a $600 billion difference, not a $300 billion difference, uh, again, over, over a 30-year period. But it also counts on the legislature, uh, or I should say uh, you know, state agencies, accurately predicting costs 20, 25, 30 years into the future. And as I explained in the report, the state has a terrible record of seeing the future. Um, one example I give is how the state forecasted the need for coal 
to be to be growing over the last several years when in fact they uh, they they overstated the need for coal in the state economy by a factor of 8 in 2016 um, even before the state had shut down its last coal power plants uh, you know th through regulations um, other examples I gave were the billion dollars that the state spent on the Tesla plant, because as you, you know, Kyle, as you may have heard from the men and women on the street, rooftop solar shingles were going to be a big deal. And the state threw a billion dollars toward Tesla to go and, and do that. Um, that building, by the way, now is, is primarily used as office space. They sold off the bulk of that manufacturing equipment. The Wall Street Journal had a really good story on this last year. And then in another instance, the state's lost about a billion dollars on a power line between Manhattan and New Jersey, uh, not because Manhattan doesn't use a lot of electricity, but because New York did a very bad job of assessing the electricity market and made speculative bets that that did not pay off. Um, you know, and they hope it'll pay off long term, but it's been 13 years that it's been losing money. It's going to lose $100 million this year, which is more than it was losing 10 years ago. So the state has this really bad, rec bad record of seeing the future. Um, like I said, they published estimates for costs below $300 billion. The costs we're looking at based on those estimates are actually around $600 billion. But if the, if the cost of what you have to do under the Climate Act goes 5% higher and the avoided activities costs go down 5%, like for instance, let's say the, natural, the price of natural gas keeps going down, then the cost of the Climate Act for New York goes over a trillion dollars, just 5% in, in those two directions, and you go up to $1.1 trillion. And I, I think you keep hitting on you know the key distinction between market forces driving some of this and this being done by centralized planners. Uh, those centralized planners a lot of times cannot predict with extreme certainty what's going to happen next. And relying on those assumptions can be costly for New Yorkers and drive more businesses and citizens out of the state. Um, but in, even more than uh, cost, I think reliability is an issue that gets brought up in your report a lot. Uh, what are some of those reliability concerns that give you concern? If I could editorialize for a moment, I don't think folks in the legislature fully appreciate how complicated it is to keep the lights on. That is to say, what kind of process is involved with predicting demand, meeting demand, having power plants ready to dispatch more electricity on a moment's notice. The electric grid in New York works in part through auctions that are conducted every five minutes to balance demand with supply. And that's just to make sure that that companies are producing enough power. That doesn't even scratch the surface on how amazing it is to, to be able to balance the grid with respect to the amount of power coming in and out of New York and then getting it down to the regional level and then down to the neighborhood level. It's, it's extremely complicated. And what the Climate Act folks seem to have done is make some really sweeping assumptions about what they can do in terms of telling, uh, essentially telling every power plant, you're going to be out of business by 2040, but we're really going to be counting on you to back up our wind turbines and solar panels in 2030. You can't go to companies and say, we're going to put a limit on how much longer you can operate and, and just hope that they're going to keep doing all the regular maintenance that they otherwise, uh, they, they, they would normally be doing if at some point their, their assets are going to become essentially worthless because of the state. And if you drill into the some of the Climate Act data, you see they expect something like 80% of the oil and gas plants in terms of their total capacity that are online today to stay online in 2030. But they expect them to only be doing about a third of the business that they're doing now. That's a really bold assumption about how much you can limit somebody's bottom line and not have them just say, well, if that's what it's going to look like in 2030, I'm not going to make investments in 2025, 2026, 2027 to, to keep this open. I'm going to go put my money in another state that's less hostile to business. So there's a danger there that the state is, is going to, you know, first off, uh, you know, scare companies out of making investments, but probably worst of all, affect decisions in ways that we're not going to see down, until down the line. So for instance, power plants might put in to retire in 2028, based on decisions that they're making right now today 
not to do upgrades and investments. And this comes back to the fact that the state doesn't have a crystal ball. They don't have their arms around this. They're making a lot of their decisions around modeling where they won't release those models to the public because these are, you know, these are, these are proprietary. And if they overstate the, uh, the availability of energy in 2030, we're going to end up having to pay a lot more to keep the lights on. Another thing they did in the, uh, that, that was concerning was they seemed to overstate how much power is going to come out of the wind turbines that are being built um, upstate especially, and then to a lesser extent in the ones in the Atlantic Ocean. And the more you overstate that, the less you appear to need battery backup storage. The batteries are really the untold story in all of this in terms of both cost and reliability. The batteries, by, by my estimate, I should say by the state's estimate, they could easily need over $100 billion in batteries to do what they're planning to do. Um, $100 billion is, I mean, that's a number that we usually would frame, you know, in the old days, we would frame that in terms of like, that's the state budget. That's the total, you know, taxes and fees collected by New York in a year. And they are saying that over the next you know, decade and a half, they're going to need that much in batteries installed downstate to keep the lights on because we have these multi-day lulls where the Atlantic winds just won't be turning their planned offshore wind turbines adequately. So between overstating the renewables, probably making unrealistic assumptions about fossil fuel plants staying online in 2030, um, and this gargantuan need for solar that doesn't have to just be funded, it has to be placed. And we're already seeing blowback in places from you know, places that don't want you know that that don't want storage you know storage cited there. So you have all these things stacked together. The thing, you know, if if you are a climate act proponent and you want to get to your targets by hell or high water, I'm concerned that one of the things that gets sacrificed is the reliability of the grid. I think that's a very valid assumption, Ken. Um, one one of the things that you mentioned is in terms of the state keeping certain studies to themselves and not releasing them to the public. Also, just the general trend of the legislature abrogating power to the executive branch and really an allowing it to take place out of public view. Um, how do you think that this process has impacted public perception and maybe engagement with these policies? Because from my from my view, when certain things come to the surface, like ga the gas stove issue, or eventually electric or electric school buses, or eventually um, you know the electric car mandate, I I think pub the public will react to it, but I don't think that currently they're feeling the pressure. Um, how do you think some of the the veiled um, policy apparatuses have, have impacted public perception on this? I, uh, if I could be a little cynical for a moment, I think that's the point. I think a lot of the reason this, the Climate Act was structured the way it was, was to keep the worst, and by worst, I mean most expensive, most damaging to potentially to grid reliability, to keep that stuff out of sight for as long as humanly possible. It's been five years since the law was adopted. We have a different governor. We have a lot of different state lawmakers. It is, you know, for the folks who voted for it, it's not their problem. And one of the related problems to that is we have a legislature that doesn't have its arms around it. Like just plain and simply, most lawmakers don't appreciate just what an undertaking it is to keep the lights on in New York. And combining their lack of knowledge on that with the fact that they have made this improper delegation of powers over to another state agency, we, we can't be shocked when we have negative consequences because they have undercut the safeguards that are designed in a democratic system to keep bad things from being done by state agencies or by executives or by kings. Uh, so just a couple more questions. So in your report, you do a little bit of a comparative analysis with other states. Other states are pursuing climate related policy and trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. How does New York State stack up to compared to what other states are doing in this area? Well, the important thing is that Governor Cuomo got the New York Times splash treatment for having had the most ambitious, furthest reaching climate plan, most aggressive, they called it at the time, uh, climate plan in the country. Other states have targets. Other, I, I don't believe any other state has gone to the extreme that New York has. 
Uh, one way that some states are doing it differently, for instance, North Carolina has has tasked its utilities with figuring out ways to to essentially decarbonize the grid. That makes a lot more sense than having the state do it because the the, the utilities have like first off have a better grip on reality than the state agencies do. They have more you know they have more technical know-how. Um, and at the end of the day, they're the ones who have to send the bills to customers. So they have more of an incentive to keep costs down than state agencies do. Um, right now, no one in state government is, is going to be held to account, it seems, for the fact that we have offshore wind turbines where the costs are are jumping by more than you know, $5 billion um, in, in just the past 48 hours. So uh, if in other states, having the utilities take a more active role in, in the process is probably going to reduce their costs. And New York probably would have been better off doing something closer to that here. So, Ken, in your report, uh, you outlined several key areas of policy reform that you would like to see happen uh, that would be beneficial for both cost and reliability uh, for the New York state energy sector. Um, what what are some of those key policy reforms that you would like to see? If I were to, if I were to summarize most of them, it's for the legislature to get back in the driver's seat. Uh, for probably first and foremost, the legislature should be demanding some studies that they previously required in state statute, but just haven't been delivered in several years. Uh, the state energy plan is several years overdue. This is something where state agencies would have to project what where they see costs and demand going over the next decade. Uh, decade. Uh, there's a reliability study that is supposed to be done every four years. The last one was done in 2012. So that one is now eight years overdue. That would give the state a pretty that would give lawmakers a, a better picture of what is happening to the grid under the under the Climate Act and what are some of the, the threats to reliability that are emerging. Uh, the state should release uh, the legislature uh, should demand that NYSERDA release its uh, twenty uh, its twenty nineteen one hundred percent renewables study. That's where Governor Cuomo had 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 them spend almost a million dollars finding the fastest way to one hundred percent renewables. I think that study paints a pretty clear picture of what that would cost, uh, what the obstacles would be. We could probably learn a lot from that study, but the Cuomo administration hid it. The Empire Center had to go to court to to just get the re, the heavily redacted copy of it that doesn't include any numbers, but we know that it shows just what a major undertaking it is, and it also you know by the way quite possibly undercuts the feasibility of a lot of what was laid out in the Climate Act, and if the state already possesses a record showing that it can't follow through on the goals that it's setting, the public deserves to know that too. So, besides introducing some transparency to the process, the legislature should also be the one making the calls about whether to implement some of these regulations. If a regulation is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars for the private sector to implement, those are the sorts of things that the legislature should be voting on themselves, if not by passing a law, at least by voting by resolution to approve those regulations. Um, in, in green guardrails, we laid out some examples from other states where the legislature has final uh, has final sign off whenever the executive branch wants to make a really sweeping regulation. Um, another thing we said was we the legislature should be the one setting the amount of renewables that uh, that utilities need to purchase because that is a tax. It is a tax. It is a check that the utilities have to cut to the state every year at the end of the day. And we should be uh, setting tax rates like that through our you know, through our elected representatives, not through a state agency making that determination. And then, and finally, we should also be making it easier to uh, to reach the state's climate goals. There are a lot of things in the Climate Act that actually frustrate that. Uh, one of them is requiring prevailing wage, where essentially we we force anyone building a battery storage plant or a wind turbine or anything else related to the Climate Act to comply with construction union contract terms. I mean, there's a reason why the construction unions are disappearing in New York and why they've shrunk so much. It's because they have these really inefficient work rules and forcing developers to, to abide by those rules is just going to slow the process of decarbonizing the economy and drive up the cost of doing it. So there's no defensible reason to be requiring you know, union contract terms on these jobs. 
Absolutely, Ken. I think I think the state makes it harder on them. They're harder on themselves uh, to accomplish the goals that they set out to by putting some of those roadblocks in the way. Um, is there anything that you would like to leave the audience with before we go that you think are the main takeaways that you want them to remember? I think the biggest takeaway is that given the scale of what the Climate Act sets out to do um, and the extent to which it punts to state agencies, these are, there are a lot of opportunities for state lawmakers to 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 basically reclaim their uh, their historical powers and uh, be the ones making the decisions about how things go. I think we'll end up with better policy, we'll end up with less costly policy, and we'll end up with a, a lot fewer unintended consequences if it's the people's elected representatives to, you know, having open debate about things and making decisions at the end of the day. Thank you, Ken, for sitting down and having this conversation. I encourage everyone to go on the Empire Center website and check out Green Guardrails, Ken's new report. Otherwise, we will uh, see you next time. For more news and analysis, visit our website and sign up for email updates at empirecenter.org. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Empire Center.